Well, welcome and good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you could join, vir join us virtually on the Zoom call for the St. Louis Regional Chamber's COVID-19 briefings. As our region begins to reopen, it's important to know how government and civic leaders are responding to ensure that our businesses are prepared to open safely and confidently. While we hope, to, hope the peak is behind us, the fight for COVID-19 is far from over. The steps we take now will provide a good foundation for our region and the state's recovery. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our healthcare and essential workers who are on the front lines during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'd also like to thank our neighbors who are helping our other neighbors and businesses helping other businesses. I've seen more acts of kindness and support that comes through every day. And that's what you can expect in the St. Louis region. Today, I'm very excited to have three tremendous speakers who will share ideas on their ongoing COVID-19 relief efforts in their respective sectors. To begin our briefing, Rob Dixon, Director of, of the Missouri Department of Economic Development, and Michael Negron, Assistant Director of the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, will give an update on the respective states' reopening plans and their state's response to COVID-19. Following their briefing, Bob O'Loughlin, CEO of Lodging, Hospitality, and Management, and a member of the St. Louis Regional Chamber's Board of Directors, will discuss the pandemic's impact on the hospitality industry and his plans for moving forward. With the demands on their schedules, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for taking their time to join our virtual meeting this morning and for their continued support of the St. Louis Region. And now I'll pass the baton to Austin Walker, Vice President of Public Policy at the St. Louis Regional Chamber. Austin? Thanks, Tom. And thanks everybody today for participating on the call. If you have a question you'd like answered by any of our speakers, uh, please use the feature in Zoom and uh, the chat feature, I should say, and we'll do our best to get your questions. Also closed captioning is provided during these briefings, so feel free to use that feature as well. Before we get started, I'd like to take this time to thank the St. Louis Regional Chamber's 2020 public policy sponsors, their contribution support, all of our public policy programming throughout the year. Well, it's great to have a good friend of the Regional Chamber and Alliance STL on this morning to start our briefing. That's Director Rob Dixon. Uh, Director Dixon has served in the Missouri Department of Economic Development since July of 2017. Director Dixon oversees the department's many administrative units, including general counsel, financial systems, budget and planning, and legislative affairs. As director, Rob has worked hard to boost economic and workforce development in the state. Before becoming director, Rob served as the president and CEO of the Missouri Community College Association. I'd like to thank Director Dixon uh, for his leadership and partnership during this public health crisis and for being a strong supporter of the St. Louis Regional Chamber and Alliance. Please welcome Director Rob Dixon. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, visit with you this morning. Uh, you know, before I get into uh, some of the issues that we're uh, here to talk about today, I just wanted to take a quick step back and kind of reflect on, frankly, the last year. It was almost a year ago to the day uh, where we stood shoulder to shoulder, uh, the governor, me, the leadership team in the cabinet, uh, Tom, Austin, uh, Adam, your public policy team at the chamber, as well as uh, many volunteer leaders uh, from the St. Louis region, and we celebrated uh, frankly, the largest economic development legislative victory that we've seen in nearly a generation. Uh, we had the GM proposal, but more, uh, more broadly based, we had uh, new workforce development and education programs with Missouri One Start, with Fast Track. We had revised economic development incentive programs with our deal closing fund. And there were many other items that we'd all been working on uh, to celebrate the best in Midwest and the Talent for Tomorrow efforts which culminated in the largest restructuring of Missouri state government in a, in a generation, all focused on workforce and economic development. That was a year ago, uh, just as the General Assembly was finishing up uh, last year. And here we are uh, a year later and the world around us couldn't be more different. Um, I think the one, the one thing I would say about that is the building blocks that we created together last year are gonna be more needed more than ever and they're gonna serve us well as we go forward into this this new normal, whatever, whatever that is. Um, but it was, as I was kind of getting my thoughts together for our conversation this morning, it's been a little nostalgic and thinking back to where we were a year ago. And uh, just, a, it's, a, it's a world of difference to say the least. So um, in, the, in more recent days, uh, 
you know, on May 4th, Governor Parson announced the beginning phase of the Show Me Strong Recovery Plan. And essentially what that was, uh, was a statewide announcement that effective May 4, uh, we could start a gradual return to business and social activity across the state. Obviously, each local jurisdiction has the authority to make locally based, or locally based decisions based on the spread of the virus at the local level. Certainly, that has been the case in the St. Louis region and as well as others across the state. Uh, but that initiated really the first phase of our, of our recovery effort. Um, it's predicated on several healthcare related pillars, as we've talked about uh, testing, the supply of PPE, the capacity in the healthcare system, as well as the use of um, advanced data and analytics to kind of predict where the course of the virus is going to go next. And if you're at all interested in seeing some of that data that we're following and the modeling that we're looking at, we do have some publicly available information at health.mo.gov. There's a link there for the analytics, and we do have uh, some details on the modeling information for each region of the state. And frankly, uh, each region of the state, is uh, the virus is playing out in different ways uh, across the board. So you'll see how it, uh, how it looks in the St. Louis region and what the projections are, as well as uh, across the state. I'm sure it's familiar to the audience on the call today, uh, just based on the sophistication of the work that you've been doing. Uh, but it's, it's something I think that's really important to note that we're looking at the virus spread regionally, uh, because that's going to allow us basically to um, fight the virus itself based on the regional priorities, but also from an economic perspective, it allows us to target and tailor our economic recovery efforts. So um, some of the things that we've uh, talked about through the governor's Show Me Recovery Plan really boil down to some common sense uh, and self-care type uh, activities. And I think it's really important to reiterate that with the business community. Uh, Tom Chulik and I had a chance to visit about uh, the governor's plan before we announced it and uh, bounced some of the ideas off of him in particular. Uh, but really it boils down to some modifications that businesses are gonna have to make um, as they go forward. You know, things like using PPE for your employees, uh, physically separating employees and customers, those, those types of common sense things. I'm not going to go through the laundry list of those. But the fact is, we're going to be in this situation for the better part of a year, a year and a half into two years, uh, where we have the virus around us and there's no vaccine widely available yet. So we have to engage in economic activity and it's going to require the business community, I think, to really lead both in the use of some of those mitigation techniques, but also in, uh, and frankly, in testing and contact tracing and the like. So let me just do a real quick um, run through of kind of where we're at right now on some of the economic impacts of the COVID virus in our state. As you can imagine, and it's, it's no shock at all to this audience, or maybe it is a shock still, um, but it's no surprise, I guess, uh, just the massive effect that the virus is having on our state's economy. Um, last week, we saw the national unemployment rate uh, uh, was, was uh, published at about 15%. Uh, and we're, we're expecting a similar result here in the, in the state of Missouri, although state level data won't come out uh, for another couple of weeks. It's always lagging at the state level, but we do expect to be in that, in that vicinity of, of the unemployment rate. Um, I think what's really important to note is that means 22 million Americans have lost their job just since the, the virus started, uh, since the states of emer state of emergency across the country was declared. And so that's a massive effect. You know this in your business uh, in particular, I'm sure. But for our state, and I know it's relevant to the conversation that we're going to have a little bit later today, uh, in particular in our state, we're seeing the, some of the uh, most significant impacts in our leisure and hospitality businesses, tourism in particular, that account for about 23% of all the unemployment claims in Missouri or in, in those industries in particular. Um, that is somewhat parallel to what we're seeing across the board. Certainly manufacturing is, uh, especially early on, was, was significantly affected by this. Um, we're starting to see some of our larger manufacturers coming back online slowly. Um, but of course, it's not just a matter of are they able to, to do the work, but they also have to have a demand for their products. And that gets into the consumer uh, side of this as well, which I know uh, is something that the chamber's been working on. Um, but there's just there's just so much, uh, so much such a broad effect of this, and it's playing out in different ways in different industries, and certainly small businesses across the board, regardless of their particular industry, are are significantly affected. 
um, the PPP program, that's the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection, Protection Program, uh, has had uh, an effect, a positive effect on helping businesses stay afloat and continuing to add folks or keep folks on the payroll, which obviously is important for our citizens and the economy. Uh, Missouri actually did fairly well, if you want to put it like that, uh, as it relates to um, kind of taking advantage of those programs uh, compared to the nation. Uh, in the first round, there's now two rounds of the PPP program. Uh, we had just about 47,000 businesses across our state. Um, that's um, frankly out of a universe of roughly 150,000 to 200,000 to begin with. So a pretty, pretty significant share of Missouri businesses uh, took advantage of that first round, nearly 47,000 of them, uh, with about $7.5 billion bringing into the state uh, for, through that program. That was actually in the top uh, top eight uh, in the country for the number of businesses that took advantage of it. The first wave of that program uh, was used up in just a little over a week and a half. Um, that was nearly $350 billion that was uh, eaten up that quickly. And so uh, the federal government did authorize a second round of that. And as of last week, an additional 32,000 Missouri small businesses have taken advantage of that, that program as well with an additional uh, $1.7 billion. So the numbers here we're talking about are just absolutely staggering. And that, again, I'm sure is no shock to you at all, but I truly want to thank the banking community of our state uh, that, that worked tirelessly to help uh, the business community, the small business community in particular, access uh, those resources. We could not, uh, we, we would not be in the shape that we're in right now. It would be much worse without their, their work. So I want to thank them on that. And then finally, uh, just as I uh, wrap up kind of the, the intro comments here, um, you know, the, the General Assembly is meeting right now in, in Jefferson City. This is the final week of the legislative session. Last week on Friday, they did meet the constitutional deadline to pass the state's budget. Um, and it is reflecting the situation that we're in right now. Uh, our state's budget director, Dan Hogg, many of you, especially that work in public policy, may have, have had a chance to visit with Dan. Uh, but he's He's explained the state's revenue situation as if it was just shutting off a water spigot. I mean, it was not a gradual decline. The state revenues dried up uh, just so rapidly that we haven't seen it like this before. So the, the state budget that was passed last year um, was a $35 billion budget, which did include the vast majority of the aid coming into the federal, from the federal government uh, into the state of Missouri. Um, it did have significant effects across the board. Um, and, you know, we're going to have to continue to look at that, that budget um, before we, you know, before the fiscal year starts in June, or in, in July, excuse me. And it's, it's not looking good, uh, just to be candid about it. And it's something that we're going to have to continue to track. Um, and we will, um, but additional hard choices are going to have to be made. Um, and it's just the, the unfortunate reality of the situation that we're in. Lastly, uh, just want to talk about moving forward because uh, we're not going to sit and wring our hands and, and just uh, woe is us or anything like that. The business community of the state, our civic leadership, as it's doing in St. Louis, uh, is happening around the state. I've uh, been in close contact with our economic development partners and will be as we move forward. But we'll be launching the second uh, phase or the next phase, I should say, of the Show Me Strong recovery plan. And really what we'll be focused on in this period is resiliency development. I know that's something that is happening in your businesses in particular, uh, but we have to be resilient to the virus and still conduct economic activity before there's a vaccine. Uh, so we'll be looking at um, focus, focus policies uh, around business, around community, around citizen uh, targeted audiences that allow for additional resiliency and additional public policy, as well as private sector, philanthropic nonprofit actions that can be taken. Unfortunately, there's a long road ahead here and we do have to um, start the recovery effort now. Uh, but I do believe strongly that Missouri has the fundamental building blocks for success. We have a diverse economy. We have that great location strategically in the, the middle of the North American continent that served us so well. And because of the work, frankly, that we did together over the last few years, culminating last year, we do have the public policy tools that we're going to need to build on for uh, long-term workforce training and retraining that's going to be required. So while there's a big road ahead, there's a tough, uh, tall mountain to climb, I'm optimistic uh, about the future, but it's going to take some time and we're going to have to get there together. So I'll stop there and I know we'll have an opportunity for some questions in a bit. Thanks for having me this morning. Director, this is awesome. Thank you very much. We really appreciate the update and your leadership and 
Uh, you reminding us of the huge win that we shared last year with Senate Bill 68 put a big smile on my face. Uh, the last week of session uh, this year uh, looks a, a bit strange, but you know we're in strange times, so um, it's to be expected. So, Director, most of the state's been open for business for about a week. Uh, how do you think businesses are operating, and you know, are most of them returning to work? Yeah, um, you know, we we're still tracking the data on that, and I still I think that Missouri. Um, is faring a little bit better in terms of uh, some of our neighboring states. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, looking pretty closely at those around us. Um, Tennessee still continues to um, outpace us in terms of where they're at right now in business activity uh, in the in the COVID response. But in terms of the other states around us, we're actually um, outperforming them a little bit. It's a bit of a mixed bag, really, in terms of across the state. A lot of that has to do with um, the differences, I think, in local orders that are in place. Um, obviously, with the St. Louis region and the Kansas City region, uh, you know, the, those uh, reopening orders coming um, after the states did, and that was, frankly, by design to allow uh, local activity to, to kind of a local virus to drive the, the ec economic activity decisions. So it's going to be continued ramping up um, over a long period of time. Um, from a small business perspective, I think that's one area that we're um, really keyed in on because that's where the vast majority of our jobs that are created uh, are jobs that are, are across the state. I know some of our large manufacturers are coming back online this week and next week uh, in particular. So we should start to see and feel that through the economy. Um, just talking about Senate Bill 68, uh, you know, General Motors, Ford, when they're, uh, when they're open and when they're operating, there are truly billion dollars, billions of dollars of ripple effects throughout our, our economy. So we'll start to see that here in the, in the next week or two as well. Sure. And so over the last week, you know, as we've seen businesses start to ramp up and, you know, get their plans together, what have you been hearing about business concerns out there across the state? What are the what's top of mind? Sure. Well, a couple of things, and I'm sure it's, it's of no surprise to the business community itself is, you know, just basic liability issues and how does this new normal that we're working in, um, how does that affect kind of the, the legal environment and regulatory environment around operating a business? You know, we're taking a look at that from our perspective and have conversations with obviously our chamber colleagues and friends as well as other uh, businesses across the street across the state and trying to balance that uh, with kind of overall public policy demand so we're looking at that um, I think there's other just cons there's there's just confidence consumer confidence issues that none of us individually are going to be able to correct it's nothing that the public sector or government itself can solve but it's going to be really all of us together to restore confidence in economic activity. That means when you go to get your hair cut, are your barbers and stylists wearing, you know, personal protective equipment? Um, are, are you as a business owner taking those precautions to um, make it safe and, and visibly safe for your customers to do business? To again, to get that, to, I think even some of that psychological confidence needs to return. So those are the things I think that uh, we really need to focus on some of its public policy. Some of it is just private actions about how we go about doing business. But that's really what it's going to take to restore that overall confidence in doing business and engaging in economic and social activity in the state. But, Director, I'm glad you mentioned liability issues. That's a priority for the chamber. Sure. Our policy council is looking into those, and you know, along with our chamber partners across the state. And uh, also that you mentioned uh, consumer confidence and restoring that. We've been having conversations in the region and the chamber has started uh, working groups along with Explore St. Louis and they've done a fantastic job. Um, but it's all about trying to prepare safely and restore uh, consumer confidence even beyond the public health guidelines. Uh, are you worried at all about the ability of businesses to uh, start restoring that confidence uh, given that, you know, the pandemic is still uh, going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly worried about it, but I do have faith that businesses individually will be able to address that concern. Um, and I think, frankly, relying on the free market and relying on good old-fashioned entrepreneurship to lead the way is what it's going to take. So from a, a business competitiveness perspective, I think those businesses that are able to clearly demonstrate to their customer base that they can create a covid uh, I hate to say it like this, but a COVID-friendly environment where people can work, people can uh, conduct, they can go in and shop and do business without that inordinate amount of fear of, of getting sick. 
that those are the businesses that are going to thrive. Um, even something as simple as just, again, having your employees wear protective equipment and going through extra steps to, to clean and sanitize those high touch um, types of surfaces in your business. It's going to come down to, again, again, private businesses and private actions to lead the way. Those that are going to do it are, is what it's going to take to restore consumer confidence. Broadly speaking, our entire economy and the world and society is going to be fundamentally changed going forward. That I think is just a given at this point. But until the virus, I mean, until there's a vaccine for the virus, the only way that that consumer confidence is really going to be restored is if private actors like business owners and business leaders really demonstrate to the public and to the, their customers that they're taking those precautions seriously and that can, customers can see it. With St. Louis City and St. Louis County uh, set to open next week, have you been recommending anything to their staff uh, you know, about how businesses can keep employees or customers safe? Yeah, you know, the governor meets very regularly with local leaders, including uh, mayors and county executives. Um, we talk regularly with our um, economic development, community development partners. The, the guidelines that we've put out through the Show Me Strong recovery effort, I think, are broadly based and do allow for that degree of local, um, the local kind of, um, you know, tweaking it to the local demands. So our, our recommendations are um, derived from the US CDC, from the Missouri Department of Health, and they're based on basically best practices uh, to go from there. So we set um, kind of some baseline uh, levels and then allow for folks to make those additional decisions on, on how they wanna build from there. Um, but again, the plan that the governor has outlined is designed specifically to allow for local and regional variations. I mean, there are some parts of the state where there is one, one case in the county. And so that means that the business community there needs to respond differently than they might do, say, right now in one of our larger metropolitan areas where there is a still widespread, um, widespread infection. So it's, it allows for that kind of local, um, local targeting, I think, that it's going to take to address this long term. Sure. So you mentioned the uh, impact on the economy that the virus is having. Uh, 22 million Americans losing their jobs, national unemployment rate, uh, you mentioned about 15 percent state, probably tracking pretty close to that. Uh, you know, provided there's not another uh, resurgence, how long do you think this could take the state to recover? Yeah, you know, I, I'd hate to um, just throw a number out there, but from previous recessions, um, and, you know, the, the Great Recession uh, is the closest comparison we have at this point, although it's, it's, it's still not even a close comparison to where we're at today. It took basically five years for state revenue to get back to where it was pre-virus um, level or pre-recession pre level. Um, GDP took many years to respond. Job creation uh, took a long time. Basically, the national, uh, the, the national unemployment rate uh, that we just, just announced this week with nearly 15% wiped out a decade's worth of job creation. So we have to see how this progresses. Um, I think we have to, to be realistic about the long road that's ahead here. Um, it's, it's going to take years, frankly, to recover fully from the effects of this thing. Um, and I think that's just the unfortunate reality. Now, where the, the dollars and cents start to come in, I don't, I don't want to throw a number out or a year's uh, prediction out here. We'll have to see. But you hit the nail on the head, Austin. I mean, it's the, the economic and the health recovery of this situation are two sides of the same coin. As goes our public health response and public health situation, so goes the economy here. And so that, that's why we are looking at it really as two sides of that same coin. Director, I just want to ask you uh, one uh, final question, be respectful of your time. You know, the uh, theme, you know, throughout this COVID uh, crisis, especially for our business, has been, um, you know, endurance and tightening belts in the state of Missouri is no different uh, with budget cuts happening. How will your department react to budget cuts and are there any differences in how you'll manage your team or, you know, will this mean less business attraction? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we're still taking a look at the budget that the General Assembly just passed, like, like the administration would do in any year. Obviously, this year requires additional scrutiny just to make sure that we still have a balanced budget based on significantly less uh, revenue coming in. Our department's mission does not change, and that's to help work with the business community, 
and the communities of our state to help create an environment where Missourians can prosper. Um, it's likely that we're going to have to do that with fewer resources tomorrow than we have today. And we have a nimble team. We have a team, frankly, we've been working from home, 100% uh, working from home as a department. We've gone entirely paperless in two weeks uh, to get ready for this. That was a longer term plan that we had as a department to be more customer friendly, but because of forced telework, uh, we had to get there. So we're going to be looking at kind of a combined use of technology. We certainly will be scaling back in certain areas, but for us, it's staying focused on our overall mission uh, because we're, we're, it's what it's going to have to take. But I think we all need to brace ourselves for serious reprioritization and serious discussions about um, what level of, of expenditures that are, are likely to happen, not because of um, you know, not, not because of any other reason other than revenues, like our budget director has said, have shut off like a spigot. And that means we have to take responsible action on that front. Well, Director Dixon, I want to thank you for joining us and for your leadership and your partnership uh, with the St. Louis business community. And I really hope that you'll pass on our appreciation to your entire team uh, over there at the department uh, for helping to support all of our businesses here and across the state. We really appreciate your efforts. Thanks so much. That means a lot. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, take care. Bye-bye. And now joining us is the Assistant Director at the Illinois Department of Commerce, Michael Negron. Assistant Director Negron has served in the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity since August of 2019. The department's mission is to support and maintain a climate that enables a strong economy for the state's taxpayers, businesses, workers, and communities by retaining, attracting, and growing businesses. Please welcome Assistant Director Negron. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can uh, everybody see my screen? Yes, thank you, Michael. Yes, sure can. Uh, wonderful. Uh, sorry, this is the uh, this is actually my first time sharing a screen on a Zoom, so I was uh, uh, anxious about getting it right. Um, so uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for having us here, for having me here. Um, I uh, I want to talk today about. Um, the uh, Restore Illinois plan that Governor uh, J.B. Pritzker uh, announced last week, which is our uh, public health driven plan to returning the economy um, to where we need it to be, um, uh, consistent with uh, the new reality that we think we're all gonna be facing. Uh, and, and also talk a little bit about what we've been trying to do as a department uh, to help assist uh, businesses uh, in this uh, unpar uh, un nearly unprecedented uh, time of crisis. So uh, in talking about um, uh, our approach at the state uh, and the plan that we released, uh, the governor's priority has been uh, uh, to lead uh, with uh, concerns about public health. Um, and uh, as part of it, our understanding uh, uh, of our economic situation um, is that the two uh, really are, are inextricably, inextricably linked. Um, so uh, in order to combat the virus, uh, we've had to take, like uh, virtually every other state in the country, uh, measures to reduce uh, 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 contact through uh, social distancing, um, uh, closing non-essential businesses, uh, limiting uh, large-scale events. Uh, and this has, of course, had a, a, a tremendous uh, depressive effect on the economy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we also believe um, that, um, and, and, and there is uh, survey data and, 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 and other uh, metrics that suggest this, that concerns about public health in and of itself has a, a major impact on confidence in the consumer uh, psyche and, and that even if we were to lift all restrictions today, um, we would not anticipate um, our, on a return to normal uh, because people are, 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 are very concerned about, um, uh, about this virus. Uh, we, we learn more and more about it um, every week, uh, new symptoms, uh, new vulnerable populations, uh, and so there's a lot of uncertainty. And so uh, the governor's approach has been uh, to take the necessary steps to reduce the increase in cases, but also to make the needed investments uh, to ensure that we have the public health infrastructure, both from a hospital capacity perspective, but then also from a, a testing, uh, tracking and tracing uh, perspective so that we can uh, live in a new normal uh, when a vaccine may be uh, 12 to 18 months away. Uh, but we wanna return to, uh, uh, to, to productive economic activity. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to have these other capacities uh, built up. Uh, so uh, the governor announced last week the Restore Illinois Plan, um, uh, which is a regional phased approach 
uh, I, I posted here um, the uh, GPA, the Illinois Department of Public Health website where um, uh, you can see uh, the data broken down by region um, uh, because um, uh, ultimately uh, the, the, the phases uh, through which we proceed uh, where more activity uh, can be uh, uh, pursued uh, is tied to public health metrics. So uh, the plan breaks down the state of Illinois into five regions. Uh, these regions are, are based off of an existing uh, uh, map of um, emergency medical systems. Uh, the Department of Public Health uh, for years has broken down the state into 11 regions based on hospital capacity and the modes of transportation of getting emergency patients to those hospitals. Uh, and in thinking through this framework, uh, our public health folks divided the state into four regions by combining these EMS regions. Um, the, each region uh, will be judged according to a set of public health metrics focused on uh, positive cases, uh, on um, uh, how we're doing on testing, how we're doing on hospital capacity, um, and uh, how we're doing in terms of setting up a contact tracing method so that when uh, new people are infected, uh, we can quickly uh, talk to them, identify who they've been in contact with, and then take action to test those folks. And as needed, um, quarantine individuals uh, having, uh, we're, the state has developed some capacity for folks who can't quarantine themselves uh, by uh, leasing out hospitals and things like that so that um, folks who need safe distance from their families uh, have that option uh, and aren't, uh, aren't on their own. Um, so the, the plan moves through five phases. Uh, and I think these phases will be familiar. There, not, while not every state has announced um, in the announced their plans in terms of phases, uh, I think we are we are all starting to think similarly about uh, about how to uh, uh, increase um, economic activity over time. And so we we have five phases um, uh, where there are different uh, uh, regulations in place, and then there's metrics um, uh, through which uh, we can advance from one phase to the other. Each of these are done at the regional level, and I'll try to move through these um, fairly quickly. I think they'll be familiar. So the first phase is the phase that uh, we were in at the, at the outset of this, which is you have an exponential increase in cases. And so that was the stay-at-home order. That's uh, essential businesses only, uh, limitations on social gathering, limitations on travel, um, and the, the priority here was to really reduce the amount of contact uh, folks are entering into with each other to try to bend that curve uh, so that uh, rate of increase um, uh, starts to flatten uh, and, and we're not overloading our hospital systems. And so those are the metrics uh, on the right hand side um, that we looked at and uh, we were able to, we've been able to flatten that curve and so now we're in, uh, the entire state is in phase two. Uh, the governor did an executive order uh, last week uh, and uh, uh, every every region of the state is in phase through uh, through May 29th. Uh, and in phase two, more activity has been allowed, uh, more outdoor activities like golf, boating, and fishing. Uh, uh, retail, non-essential retails can do delivery and curbside pickup. Um, essential stores, which were operating uh, previously, uh, have uh, capacity limits um, uh, so that there's a uniform standard. Um, and uh, uh, we're continuing to, to try to um, deal with uh, unique in, uh, businesses that come up uh, on a case-by-case -case basis um, um, so that we can continue to allow more and more activity. Uh, but this is also uh, an, an important phase where we're, we're really accelerating our investments in contact tracing. And so you'll see on the right-hand side, that's where tracing becomes uh, an important part of moving to the next phase. Uh, and so from a statewide level, um, uh, the governor has identified a need to, to hire 3,800 uh, contact tracers uh, and uh, using a, a hub and spoke model, the Department of Public Health uh, is working with uh, local organizations to, to set these systems up in place. Uh, and so that's the, that's the big part, uh, the, uh, the heavy lifting that has to happen this month, which uh, to just bring it back to what I said at the outset, uh, we think as we lift activities, uh, while uh, uh, there, there are people who will uh, really rush out and take advantage of them, uh, and, and we, we encourage that, uh, there are many others who are going to be very reluctant. Um, uh, and so uh, part of building confidence amongst consumers is, is to being able to show that we can test, uh, we can test at a broad scale, that we have contact tracing uh, so that we can respond quickly um, to uh, new uh, outbreaks, uh, because uh, the last thing we want to see, and, and this has been part of our conversations with businesses across the state 
is while people are eager to get up and running again, they're afraid that they're going to get up and running and then there's going to be a new outbreak and then, then uh, 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 there's going to need to be a renewal in the stay at home order. Uh, and so the, the, the possibility of moving forward and then having to move back uh, is, it, is a source of a lot of anxiety amongst businesses who are otherwise very eager to open, uh, but, but they are concerned that uh, there could be rapid outbreaks. So we want to make sure that we have that infrastructure in place. Uh, the next phase is phase three. Uh, this is where, uh, you know, when we see um, uh, sustained uh, 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 reductions in the percentage positive rate of our tests, uh, we, we have flat levels of hospital admissions. Uh, we maintain that surge capacity and the testing and the tracing are in place. Regions can move to the next phase where all retail uh, is allowed with, fa uh, with face coverings and, and capacity limits. Barbershops and salons can open. Uh, fitness clubs can do some limited activity. Um, office workers and, and, and uh, can come back to work, although we will encourage um, continued uh, work from home uh, and other measures. Um, and all manufacturing can operate um, uh, as well. And, and across the board, um, there would be uh, safety guidance uh, uh, issued by uh, the Department of Public Health in partnership with our department uh, so that there's a, a standard that uh, businesses can look at when thinking about how they can operate safely. And so that's something that uh, we're actively developing with public health now uh, with an expectation that they'll be ready to be issued uh, for review in, in the coming weeks. Um, and uh, this next phase, well, this is what will happen at a regional level. So we are currently as a state in phase two, but when the order ends on uh, May 29th, we anticipate that there will be uh, uh, some differentiation, that some regions will be able to move to this phase uh, and uh, the, potentially uh, the Northeast region, which is the Chicago area, uh, it's not clear. Uh, so there's, there's data uh, and it's still weeks away, but the, but the, the governor yesterday talked about uh, data at the regional level and, and we shared um, a status update on, on where the different four regions were um, so that uh, people can just understand uh, where things are as a state um, and, uh, and, we, and there's a transparency uh, about um, how our health system is doing and, and when businesses can start to ramp up. Um, after phase four, after phase three, we move to phase four where there's uh, restaurants can come back into, into, into business with capacity limits. Uh, theaters can open with capacity limits. Um, uh, schools and, and child care can operate um, uh, uh, closer, to, uh, closer to normal. Um, and so this is a, this is a phase where uh, we can see a lot more of a return to normal here. Uh, although, of course, there's still some, some major differences. We don't envision uh, large-scale events uh, being possible in this phase. Uh, and, and there's a ceiling on, uh, on gatherings uh, in this phase. Um, but uh, if you look um, for the criteria to moving to phase five, uh, it's brief and it, it's, it's brief uh, because we uh, are aware that there's a lot changing. So what, uh, where things stand now, uh, our, our public health experts uh, envision, um, uh, yes, you know, if there's a vaccine that would be, uh, that would allow a, a, sh a shift in what, uh, what sorts of activities we would feel safe um, as a state pursuing, but um, there, are other, there are other paths there. Uh, the availability and the development of uh, uh, treatment options, there's a, a, a broad range of tests happening right now and, and some are showing uh, real promise. And so if there's a development of, of antiviral treatments, uh, that can be a game changer. Uh, or if, if our, uh, our, our efforts to, to reduce cases uh, are significant and we see a substantial uh, and major reduction in cases over a sustained period of time, uh, that can be another path forward. And I think uh, every day um, uh, we're hearing from businesses, we're hearing from residents, we're talking to public health. And so um, I think the important thing about this component and really the entire plan is that the governor wanted to release a framework um, we wanted to be transparent about it. We wanted to put our best thinking out there, but we also know that we're going to learn more about the viruses. We're going to communicate with businesses and find out uh, different uh, innovative ways of, of doing business safely. And so uh, we anticipate that there could be uh, revisions and adjustments made to this plan uh, as time goes on. But the important thing from our perspective as an administration was to make sure that we were talking to residents, that they understood where we were from a public health perspective and that um, there was a plan in place um, and that we were thinking about this from a regional perspective. Uh, and so if we, if we do advance, uh, if and when we do advance to phase five um, in, in the near future, uh, the thinking is that's when you return to um, uh, uh, 
essentially a normal state of affairs. You know, we think just as with other crises in the past, um, there are some things that will be with us. It could be temperature checks, it could be, um, uh, you know, different approaches to telework and office space. Um, so I, I don't think anybody really anticipates um, that things will look exactly as they did back in February. Uh, but we, we think when you're in phase five, uh, when the cases are under control, when you have therapeutics or you have a vaccine, uh, you can have large events, you can have sporting events, you can have a school and places of, of recreation in full operation. You can have restaurants uh, approaching normal um, occupancy with just new types of uh, precautions in place. Um, so uh, that's where we're trying to go. Uh, this, this, this is what motivates um, the, the governor's emphasis and his push on our public health teams and our and 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 other teams to get uh, testing up and to get contact tracing up uh, because ultimately uh, uh, we believe that um, uh, until you have uh, the the pandemic under control uh, until you have the public health infrastructure in place really can't return uh, to uh, normal um, economic activity and so we we viewed those as, as married um, and, and tied closely together, and, and that's why we've been very clear to, to talk about them um, together. Uh, and so with the, I just want to take the next few minutes uh, to just highlight um, what we've been trying to do as a department um, to, uh, to, to, to provide some support to business. I think we, I lead off here with the federal, uh, just to make the, the point, as I'm sure um, has been um, uh, uh, the experience in Missouri and other states in that uh, we are all collectively doing the best we can with the resources that we have available, but no individual state can match what the federal government brings to bear. Uh, and so, um, you know, we've been um, actively watching and advocating for more assistance. Um, and, and, and as uh, programs like the Paycheck Protection Program and the EADL loans come into, to have, have come online, we have used our outreach tools, our education tools to try to push uh, and educate businesses on how to access those programs. Uh, and so uh, in Illinois, in the first round, um, uh, the state of Illinois was a fifth in the nation in um, loan volume, uh, reached about 16 billion in loans uh, to 70,000 businesses. Um, and uh, with this round, we're trying to make sure that we are as a department uh, connecting uh, businesses to our small business development centers, to our frontline staff, to uh, make sure that we can access those programs because when you're working with the federal government, you're, you're talking about billions of dollars. And as, as you'll see, when we're talking about our resources, we are talking about millions of dollars. And so we, uh, uh, we, we, we try to fill holes. Um, we try to reach those, um, those uh, businesses that have not uh, been able to benefit uh, from uh, the federal programs. Uh, so uh, what we've had available are uh, the, the governor passed a $40 billion capital plan um, uh, about, uh, just under a year ago, and we've continued um, to make those resources available um, so that businesses can access those. Uh, and uh, we launched an emergency loan program uh, that businesses can apply for for small businesses. Um, uh, there is a, we've repurposed uh, community development block grants. Um, to provide microloans to businesses uh, via their local governments. Um, and then as we learn about other benefits, um, we've tried to, to make sure that we're getting information out um, so that uh, programs that we're not running um, uh, can still be accessed by uh, businesses. So with that, um, I will, uh, I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, but uh, displayed up here is the different ways of reaching us. We have a general hotline. Um, if there are business, if there are questions about the governor's current executive order and and how those those essential business uh, uh, guidelines apply, there's a number you can call or an email inbox. Um, and so, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. We're available, and we want to help. Assistant Director, thank you very much. That's a fantastic update, uh, very helpful for our members. I want to be respectful of time, but I do have a question. So regarding the governor's plan uh, to reopen Illinois, uh, how have businesses reacted? And uh, what kind of input did DCEO have in it? Um, so I think, you know, the, the businesses have, um, there, there are some sectors that have been concerned um, about uh, how quickly the plan moves along. Um, the uh, you know, I think when you look at those sectors that are tied to um, uh, whether it's conventions or tourism uh, or, or hospitality, 
they, they would like it to move faster. And, you know, they always acknowledge um, that they also want to, to take care of their employees and their customers. Uh, and so I think the number one um, uh, concern that we've heard uh, is from those sectors uh, where you have uh, large gatherings of people in social settings or for entertainment reasons, uh, they want things to move faster. And, and it, it is really understandable. Um, you know, I think, I think we agree as a department and, and that's been um, uh, how, we've, how we've talked about it internally, but um, we also, um, as, I, as I've said a couple times in this presentation, we also understand that fundamentally there is no recovery without public health. And uh, the, the governor's uh, guiding light has been now, how do we move things along in a manner that doesn't cause a new outbreak? Because um, if we uh, if we do, for example, what's happened in South Korea, which has done a tremendous job of uh, having a testing and a tracking and a tracing system in place, and and the country got its cases under control, uh, it loosened up uh, restrictions with respect to bars and nightclubs, and within four days they've had to shut things down again because there was a new outbreak. Uh, and so what we we will remain in in, in dialogue uh, with those sectors that. Um, that are particularly reliant upon uh, large gatherings, uh, social gatherings, and we'll talk to them about ways of, uh, if they have uh, creative ideas, innovative ideas for uh, ensuring public safety, we will listen um, and, and we'll, we'll, um, we'll talk as an administration about uh, whether there are changes that can be made, uh, but fundamentally anything that's done has to be consistent with public health. Uh, we have to take a look at this as not a two month crisis, but as something that we're gonna be dealing with for a while. Uh, and that means we gotta make sure that as we, ra as we ramp up uh, more activities, we don't invite uh, another outbreak that causes us to shut things down, which would just, the economic impact of that uh, would, would be just so dire. And so we need to make sure that, that we are taking the steps to, to avoid that. Well, Assistant Director, really want to thank you for being on and giving the fantastic update. Uh, really appreciate everything uh, that you and uh, the folks over the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity uh, are doing for uh, the state and for Southwest Illinois. Uh, we really appreciate you making the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now joining us is Bob O'Laughlin, uh, CEO of Lodging Hospitality Management. One of the region's premier lodging and hospitality management companies, LHM has expanded its portfolio with 17 hotel properties. LHM's portfolio includes the Hilton St. Louis at the ballpark, the Hilton St. Louis Airport, and St. Louis Union Station. Most recently, LHM completed a $187 million revamp of Union Station that included the installation of the St. Louis Aquarium and the St. Louis Wheel. We all look forward to visiting the aquarium and the wheel when things go back to normal. My family's been talking about meeting Coco the Sloth. Uh, so I'd like to thank Bob for joining us today and please welcome Bob O'Loughlin. Mr. O'Loughlin, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, to be here, can you hear me? We can indeed. Okay, uh, the hospitality industry as was cited earlier, uh, has probably uh, been hit the hardest of any industry, uh, and uh, uh, we feel it to this day. Uh, and, uh, you know, travel uh, and hospitality, tourism, meetings, conventions, uh, as all small businesses make up about 85% of all jobs. And a lot of the jobs of 34 million uh, people that are out of work are basically in the travel hospitality industry. And uh, as we slowly open up, uh, we're still very restricted, as the individuals before me had said, uh, in how we can get back, how soon we can get back, and how is it safe for both our employees and our customers. Uh, as an essential uh, industry, uh, we still have all of our hotels open. Uh, we take care of all of the airline people that travel around the country all of the meetings and necessary meetings that have to happen. But our industry has gone from about 80% occupancy down to single digits. So we're very uh, excited and want to get back to work. Uh, we have protocol in our uh, businesses, which started early on, uh, which we mirror all of the hospitals, uh, where you have to have a five check protocol before you come to work, taking your temperature, uh, making sure that uh, uh, your health is in good shape. Uh, we take your temperature uh, before you go to work. Uh, we also uh, will, when we reopen the aquarium, have an infrared 
a machine that will test the temperature of anybody going there, uh, will have the distancing, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, as we all know, uncharted territory that our industry or uh, basically all of us in the world have never been through before. And we have to learn as we go through it. Uh, I mean, there's certain things of, uh, you know, how does everybody travel on an airplane uh, and uh, get to a location then distance six feet apart? Uh, how do 77% of all the people work uh, are husbands and wives and they have to have daycare center? How do you distance daycare uh, people and then have them go back? Uh, it's, it's a tricky, slippery slope uh, place that we're all in and one size doesn't fit all. I have to compliment uh, our governor uh, and Rob Dixon and the people in the state of Missouri uh, that as they've rolled it out, it's one size doesn't fit all. Uh, they're leaving it up to the uh, mayors, the county executives and the different counties to determine how many cases, uh, the tracking, the tracing. And I think uh, we've seen uh, not only in Europe, uh, China, New York and throughout the country that there's a lot of different uh, ways that uh, people are handling this thing. And I think we learn every day. So as we roll out with 15% or 25%, I agree with uh, Michael who was just on, uh, this virus is gonna be with us a couple of years. We're certainly hopeful uh, that the uh, virus uh, and uh, uh, the different vaccines uh, may come on next year. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, the United States leads the world in innovation and entrepreneurship. I think uh, different types of medication will roll out. So if you do get it, uh, that uh, in two or three days, you can take the medicines and be back to work. I think the statistics that we've seen roll out from all over the world is that basically people uh, in the re recent MIT study that was supported by Stanford, uh, USC, et cetera, is that people 18 to 44 percent have a, a, a 44 years have a 0018 of ever dying from this. It's more like flu-like system uh, uh, symptoms, and that those are the people that we have to slowly get back into the workforce, take care of the people with pre-existing conditions, the elderly. Uh, hold them back uh, and have different set of circumstances. I don't think we can just say everybody has to do this and everybody has to do that. We have to be creative. We have to be an entrepreneur in uh, reopening uh, what goes on in our communities. So uh, from an industry that has gotten severely hit hard, uh, we've got the protocol to reopen. We are open. We've always been open as an essential uh, business. And uh, we want to get back uh, the 34 million people that are unemployed where we have to weigh, uh, you know, uh, basically our healthcare system uh, versus uh, uh, our economy and how much damage it'll, it'll have. Uh, we all listen to Jim Bullard, who I have a lot of respect for. Uh, like the rest of the world, we probably can miss one quarter, uh, which is the second quarter. Uh, but this easing up, uh, hopefully uh, uh, without any health problems, uh, can continue because there's not too many quarters we can have. We will go into a deep depression and uh, we'll be at this for uh, the five years that uh, Michael had indicated or Rob, I forget who. So uh, it's, it's something that everyone has to work together. Uh, it can't just be one segment. Uh, can't be one size fits all. And uh, we in the hospitality travel industry uh, stand steadfast to assist in any way we can. So thank you for your time. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Laughlin, we really appreciate you being here. And from what I understand, uh, LHM uh, has been uh, really helping to uh, lead the way uh, along with Explore STL for the industry. And uh, trying to figure out guidelines for how to operate. So we really appreciate your leadership in the community. And um, we do have a question. So how are hotels holding up during the pandemic? And uh, you kind of mentioned that, but what does the region's hotel landscape look like? 
when the uh, it looks pretty bleak. Uh, a lot of the hotels have been closed all over the country, including in St. Louis. Uh, they've been closed till they can reopen. Uh, even though we're an essential uh, business and can open, and we've been open through the whole uh, environment, and have employed of all our, our employees, uh, that basically it's one thing to say the hotel's open, but if you restrict it to no more than 50 people can meet, uh, basically a lot of the hotel chains have decided to close because there's not many thousand room hotels that have meetings of 50 people or less. So it's pretty bleak and will continue to be bleak through maybe phase four in Illinois. And we're hoping in St. Louis that uh, uh, we can uh, relieve some of the uh, uh, penal uh, number of people that can meet. Yeah, we've been hearing a lot about large gatherings being really restrictive for hotels and, you know, that being, um, you know, a key thing to focus on when we're talking recovering safely. So what are you planning on doing to ensure people feel comfortable when large gatherings are allowed? Well, we do the uh, six feet, uh, you know, apart uh, in all meetings. Uh, we, we obviously have temperatures that uh, will be taken either through the infrared or personal uh, for all of the attendees, uh, as all of our employees. Uh, the food uh, will be also distributed. Uh, we're incurred, we have all of our employees with masks and gloves. Uh, we have available masks for any of the attendees that uh, either want to dine with us or meet with us. And we're working uh, very closely with the Convention and Visitors Commission and also uh, the travel industry uh, meeting industry to have all of the strict protocols that are throughout our country. So how are you uh, planning on bringing your banquet businesses back? Uh, is that obviously a bit different? Yeah, we're actually looking, uh, a lot of the banquet business has, and it, it, it will evolve, as I said earlier, that as people feel more comfortable going out, uh, you know, through St. Charles and the rest of our region, uh, Mother's Day was well attended, uh, and I think as we open, uh, people will feel more comfortable to get out there. There's a cabin fever, uh, and I think once people feel more comfortable and they know some of the uh, uh, treatments that are used in the hospitals uh, are, are working, and then they find out that the statistics are basically, if you're 18 to 44, uh, you're going to be in pretty good shape. I think banquets will start to reopen. Uh, right now, uh, we've canceled them. Uh, most of the uh, uh, meetings and conventions have been canceled through the fall, uh, but we still have meetings that want to uh, come. We have banquets, weddings uh, that want to have people. Uh, where we used to have maybe 300 for a wedding, we'll have six people at a banquet table. And so we'll only have 150 people. We're doing everything we can to make people feel comfortable and that they'll be okay. I think what we really need from elected officials, uh, from people in the healthcare, once the statistics are out that we haven't overrun the hospitals, we're back to elective surgery, uh, that uh, the message comes out that says, Certain people can travel, certain people can go to uh, different places. Right now we have it, uh, either you stay in uh, or you go out, uh, but you know, there are certain uh, criteria to go out. There has to be some place in the middle uh, that uh, makes people feel comfortable and then I think uh, things will start to move along. Uh, this is just the last question, and I got to say, Mr. Laughlin, this is St. Louis, and uh, I love what's going on uh, downtown at the Union Station uh, in the Wheel. Uh, I've been in it. I think it's awesome. Uh, people are really wondering uh, about the aquarium and Wheel and, you know, how uh, they're going to adapt uh, with opening with social distancing measures in place. Uh, do you have uh, any idea what that might look like? I know you mentioned uh, possible temperature checks. Yeah, that's a great question. As far as our wheel goes, which you know has become very iconic in the whole region, uh, we only have four seats on each wheel. So we are encouraging only one family, or even if it's two people or one person that wants to go on the wheel, they'll go individually. We'll wipe it down. Uh, all our personnel have masks on and gloves. Uh, we have hand sanitizers. You're six feet apart before you get on the wheel. 
uh, as we open up the soda fountain, which is very popular, uh, we will only have half the population in there, so they'll be spread out. Uh, likewise, in the aquarium, that's where we have the infrared machine, so it'll test your temperature before you go in there. And we will have uh, timing. Uh, where we'll only have about 15% of the people will go through uh, on an hourly basis, so they'll be well spaced out. So basically, if it's you and your family, you'll be virtually the only ones going through the aquarium. So we, we've really put in some really strict protocol. Well, Bob, thank you very much, and um, thank you for joining us in today's COVID-19 briefing. Um, as our region and our nation begins a slow reopening, the St. Louis Regional Chamber remains committed to serving as a resource, convener, and advocate for our members, investors, and community partners during these challenging times. To keep things in perspective, the Cardinals would have played the Pittsburgh Pirates today at a 6.05 start. So just getting us thinking about the boys this summer gives us some optimism. So please join us for the Voices of the Region webinar on Keeping Profits Flowing. And our panel of experts will show how having a successful financial service and sales team effectively keeps your business profits flowing. The Zoom meeting will be held this Friday, May 15th at 8 a.m. So please go to our website for more details. Thank you again for joining our virtual meeting. Our meeting is adjourned.